This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Tick Ticks. Buying tickets shouldn't be anonymous. We are built for fans, by fans. Available on Android and iOS. Are you ready? See you, Brad? It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. <laughs> And we're back as the Calgary Flames 2017-2018 training camp is in progress. And as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt, and we're here to start a new hockey season. Matt, how are you feeling? Well, this offseason has been one of the best in recent memory, and it's just waiting for the opening day puck drop, and let's beat those Oilers. We talked a little bit about this, you know, when we did our shows in January or in July, but it's been a fun off season to be a Flames fan. Like, there's been a lot of movement. There's, I think, been a lot of excitement around this team. It's one of the years I can remember where I've really been excited to go, okay, let's just drop the puck and get going. Yeah, well, since the early 90s, when the Flames were a contending tier team, the Flames haven't had a team like this, where the expectations aren't, oh, we might make the playoffs. They are... Are you going to win the division? Are you going to win the conference? Are you going to win the President's Trophy? And that's a exciting thing, definitely, because it's been over 25 years. And I think for the first time in a long time, the Flames, with the moves they made in the offseason, planted their flag and said, this team is a playoff team. I mean, we've heard gms in the past say yeah we're expecting to make the playoffs but i mean with the moves they made and the futures they gave up this team has to be a playoff team and has to go further than the first round oh for sure if the flames lose in the first round or miss the playoffs entirely it's a disastrous season and it's just yeah it's there's no excuse at that point well, let's get into talking about training camp since we're right in the middle of training camp. And the Flames uh, today made some roster moves to reduce their training camp roster to 28 players, three goalies, eight defensemen, 17 forwards. And we know that before the uh, puck drops, they're going to have to reduce that to at maximum 23. But Matt, you and I have been talking a lot over the summer, and especially as we've been going to the training camp or the preseason games, and we said, you know what, there's opportunity here. Like For the first time, the Flames seem to have left a few spots for some of the kids, but none of the kids look like they want those spots in the way that they're playing. What are your thoughts on what we've seen so far from some of these kids that are fighting for a spot? It's frustrating uh, because you always want to see your own prospects that you've followed for years on end succeed and take those spots in the NHL. You'd like to see guys like Poirier, Klimchuk, Shin Carrick even come in and win a spot so that way you can not just cheer for them as Stockton players but moving forward into actual Calgary Flames and not one of them, by and large, has stepped up into the actual roles. And guys like even Brett Kulak and Tyler Watherspoon, who are kind of expected to vie for the 6-7 spots, they've been, frankly, horrible to the point where I honestly see Rasmus Anderson starting off the season with the Flames because the other guys are not anywhere near as good and you know you think that coming into this year especially with there being obviously open spots we would have seen a lot more competition for those spots but you're right I mean there's really been I'd say one forward and one defenseman who've played their way into a spot and I don't even think like using Anderson as an example I don't even think he's particularly done a great job in and of himself it's just that You've got guys like Barkowski, Kulak, and Watherspoon who, in each of their games, has been responsible directly for multiple goals against just on defensive lapses. And, like, as long as you're not making mistakes, like, you're just going to stand out. And Anderson has made a couple of mistakes, but nothing dreadful like the other guys. And I think if he continues in the remainder of the training camp to play adequately he will inherit that number six spot just because 
the other guys just simply aren't performing. And, you know, I think part of that could also be a bit of a motivation tactic by the coaches. Say, okay, we're going to, you know, maybe give Anderson the spot to start with. And then, you know, Kulak or whoever else, it's yours to win back. Oh, for sure. And that would, you know, especially a guy like Kulak, it, it's pretty much been his name penciled in as the number six all off season. So if he doesn't step up, then that really lets you know exactly what you have in Brett Kulak and whether or not you can plan around him moving forward. Or like in the past couple of years with Tyler Watherspoon, where you kind of like, oh, he's not going to quite make it. So it, and it, it's similar up front, like it, guys like Shin Carrick, Klimchuk, and Poirier, they needed to show that they were at least ready to vie for a fourth line spot, 13th forward. And I don't think any of them did. And I think accordingly, you have to kind of reduce the expectations of them actually ever playing in the NHL on a regular basis in the same way that Watherspoon kind of got demoted into that bust adjacent territory and i think those guys unless they have a great season in stockton are going to head down that path as well i can i have mixed feelings on poirier being reassigned so uh just so everyone knows as we record this today on the 26th the flames sent david riddich brett pollock morgan klimchuk ryan lomberg and spencer food to the ahl and they also placed three players on waivers for the purpose of being reassigned. Hunter Shinkarik, Emil Poirier, and Tyler Watherspoon. As well, Dylan Dubé and Yusuf Alamaki were sent to their respective junior clubs. But, you know, the two names I want to talk about here up front are Poirier and Shinkarik. And I really thought Poirier was going to make the team this year. After the story the Flames have told about him in the offseason. And, you know, the troubles and the demons that he conquered. And working with Gratz. And, you know... He came in here, everyone I think was excited about him. And he's also a right winger. I mean, this team needs right wingers. So I think this was really his spot to lose. But he also lost half a season last year. So I can sort of understand him starting the year in the AHL, getting, you know, showing us that he can still do this after being out for half a season. And I expect that he may come back up. Oh, for sure. And like, I'm expecting it, it's possible. Like, if he has a good season. I, I think any of them, whether it's Fu, Lomberg, Klimchuk, Poirier, any of them have a good season, they will get opportunities. It's just uh, he didn't show enough, and none of those players showed enough. And like a guy like Spencer Fu, who was hyped coming into the off season, he made some good plays, but. He wasn't like Jankowski where, like, every time he was on the ice, he was noticeable in a positive way. And that'll take some time, and maybe those guys turn out, maybe they don't. But for right now, on the overall, for me, especially us both covering him for years, I, frankly, was very disappointed by the group as a whole, and... I had higher expectations for most of the players and you know it's well let's just talk about Foo for a sec since you brought him up I mean this is a player that was signed to some fanfare this summer we talked about him in July at the prospect camp he played for Union College last year he put up 62 total points with Union in 38 games He's a good prospect, but I think that anyone who's expecting Fu to jump right from the college ranks directly into the NHL, I think that's an unrealistic expectation. I've said this since we signed him. I think he's a great prospect. I don't see him making the team this year. I mean, yeah, I might get a call up here or there, but I think the AHL is the right place from the start of the year because he really needs that, um, you know, he needs to adjust to the program. And I think the AHL being that it's slightly slower than the NHL, being that it's, you know, a great development league, I think that's the right place for Fu to be. I don't doubt he'll make the NHL, but, you know, at his age, there's no reason to rush him up. Oh, no. And as you said, he does look like a quality prospect, and if the Flames weren't deep up front, then, like, say the Flames were Vancouver, then I think all of Shin Carrick, Poirier, Klimchuk, and Fu would make the NHL if we're talking Vancouver's organizational depth. 
Matt, don't talk that way. We've gone through our rebuilding years. That's behind us. True, but n- n- that's a part of uh, the reason why expectations are different about this team because they are legitimately good pretty much one through 12 up front one through five at least on defense and in net so that leads us into another topic that's been brought up hold on before we go there i just want to mention one other forward and there's a guy i've liked since we acquired him and that was hunter shinkarik i mean shinkarik was a first round draft pick in 2013 24th overall by the canucks when we acquired him, I was excited. And I don't know about you, I'm starting to wonder if Shin Carrick might be a bit of a boss. Like, he's just not showing what you'd expect for that 22-year-old sort of on the verge of making the NHL. I don't know if, if Shin Carrick's ever really going to pan out to be anything at this point. Back when the 2013 draft happened, I did not like Hunter Shin Carrick as a prospect due to the fact that... It, attitude wise he seemed to have a larger attitude than the talent level he possesses and like we've seen with guys like say Dion Phaneuf like Phaneuf if he had Jankowski's willingness to listen to coaches I have no doubt that Phaneuf could have been a Chris Pronger type defenseman just an absolute monster at both ends of the ice and but he thought he was better than what the coaches were saying, didn't listen, and then just didn't progress at all, and is just a middling defenseman. And with Shin Carrick, I think it's the same thing where, yeah, he's a very skilled player, but he seems to be getting in his own way, where when he's on the ice attempting to score, he's a perimeter player, and where a coach might instruct him that well in the nhl you need to actually go to the front of the net in order to pick up goals and he doesn't seem to have made that turn into generating offense from that home plate area in front of the net and i don't know if he'll ever make that transition and i hope he does but because skill wise he is an nhl player it's just that the effort and all that is not there and he's not using his own abilities efficiently and that's what's causing the hang-up i think that he's got some great skills but to me he doesn't have the all-around game that's required in the nhl and i'm hoping that another year in stockton um he's been there for two seasons now will help him out and i still think there's I think there's hope with this guy, but I mean him, Poirier, a lot of these guys, they're going to be 23 or even older next year. I think the Flames really have to decide, do we keep him in the organization or do we cut bait? And that's the unfortunate thing. And like I could see. And this might be a guy that, you know what, maybe there's some trade value for, maybe there's not, but I think the Flames have to decide, you know, what do we do? Yeah. Like I could see the flames either including these players in trades or like getting recouping a late round pick or something like that. If they don't progress at some point during this season, because you know, you might as well get something if the player seems to have stalled out. Cause sometimes just a change of scenery might be enough for a player to rekindle things. So we'll see. Well, Matt, we've talked about who didn't look good. Um, talking about forwards, defensemen, prospects, and veterans, who do you think is looking good so far at camp? Uh, one player has stood out above the rest in terms of expectations versus on-ice play, and that's Mark Jankowski. And I think that a lot of people expected Jankowski to be in the running to make the NHL, but as a bubble guy. And I think that with how he's played, that I don't think that he should be just put on the fourth line and slowly brought along. I think that he could play a higher role in the team, even if um, the Flames opt to use him in the same manner they used Bennett, where they threw him on the wing for the first season and then transitioned him to a center next year. Because I think with his on-ice awareness, the fit naturally 
I think, would be with him, Backlund, and Froelich because all three of them are very smart two-way forwards. And that way you free up Kachuk to be utilized in a more offensive role, perhaps with either Monaghan or Bennett, depending on if they feel that Bennett couldn't slide in with Gaudreau or whatever. Right now, though, I don't know if I want to break up that 3M line. It, it, it's one of those things that I Which... think that... And this is not a slight to Backlund or Froelich, but I think that Kachuk is too good of a player to be put on a line with those guys. And I think that Kachuk could actually carry a line by himself in terms of generating offense. And, like, I understand what you mean, but it's utilizing each asset to their fullest potential and I think that with Jankowski being a very cerebral player you might be able to get away with using him in that spot and freeing Kachuk up to play a more prominent role see I it's interesting you mentioned moving Kachuk because I was looking at what would I do for lines for opening day if I was the coach and one of the things that I did actually run in my head was what if I take what if you take a chuck off the three M line, put somebody else there, um, you know, maybe Lazar, maybe Janko, somebody, and then make a line of Kachuk, Bennett, and Versteeg. That's possible. Or you, what I've been uh, toying with is um, having Bennett with actually Gaudreau and Furland, and freeing up Kachuk to be with Monaghan and a right winger, whether it's Versteeg or somebody that we'll be talking about in a minute, or Jankowski and then Jankowski with Backlund and Froelich, that gives you three really dynamite lines. And then the fourth line with Stajan, Brower, Lazar, Hathaway, whatever permutation fits the day. I think, honestly, you're going to see Gullitson start with pretty familiar lines, at least the first two. You have your Gujo, Monaghan, Furland, and Kachuk, Backlund, Froelich to start. Um, but definitely, there could be some changes made later on. I think going into the season, I want to keep Gujo and Monaghan together, at least at first, to try and you know spark some offense right away. They both had a rough start last year, and I think that the chemistry is proven there but i know what you're saying about bennett and, well the the you know, thing is that together they've looked good in well the that's the thing the that line with gaudreau Furland, and bennett looked really good in that one game and but that's one game i know and yesterday kachuk and monahan looked fairly good together so it's possible where you could get away with doing that because like if you look at a team like chicago when they were winning cups they had they did not play Kane and Taze together even though those are the two best players on the team and I think that by spreading the wealth a bit throughout the lineup it allows you to have more favorable matchups and because like your number one pairing on the other team can only play so many minutes and they can't play against Goudreau and Monaghan if they're on separate lines so then you're getting three, four, and five, six defensemen, which frees up a lot of possibilities for generating that offense. I can see breaking up Goudreau and Monaghan on the power play. I, yeah, maybe. I don't know. We'll see how the season goes. Yeah. But I think if I was the coach, I'd start them together and maybe make I, some tweaks I, from there. Yeah, but this I, I team think needs that... to start out well, and I don't want to put too many you know, variables in there that might give them a rough start like last year. Yeah. Oh, I'd like to see over the last uh, preseason games for them to experiment some more. Because you know what's tried and true. It's just seeing if there's anything else that works. Because that's what preseason's for. Exactly. That and working off the rust from the summer. Um, so Matt, talking before we wrap up kind of our preseason wrap up here, the other name that's been floated a lot this summer in association with the Calgary Flames was Yarmer Yager. There has been some talk that, you know what, maybe the Flames could use a bit more of a veteran presence. yager has been out there. Some hopeful Flames fans have put a Ginla's name out there. Um, I haven't heard Doan's name, but he's available. What are your thoughts on the Flames potentially bringing in one of these veterans to take one of the roster spots? For me, I look at 
the trade deadline and the flames have a lot of cash available especially in terms of trade deadline cap value and you look at players that are acquired at the deadline either they work adequately or usually they don't fit in and i'm thinking of martin hansel with minnesota last year and like we've seen with a guy like dougie hamilton when he first came to calgary it took him a month month and a half to figure out the system and how to play effectively well with the trade deadline coming with one month left in the season you can't really airlift a core ish piece in at the last second and expect them to fit in right away and even a guy like Yager, where he's a proven commodity if you have him in from the early part of the season he might struggle for October but he should gel with the team as it goes along and that's where I'm kind of torn because like uh, realistically if the flames were to go get Yager right now then the flames likely would not have any or much space at the trade deadline to actually go out and acquire any additional things that they may need so it's kind of one of those things where we need some additional depth scoring and a guy like Yager would be perfect for a second third line right wing it's just do you want to sacrifice the flexibility in order to do that? And I think that with the Flames prospects failing by and large to impress, I think that may end up leading more towards signing Yager or Aginla than just letting things stand. Because you also got to figure that the first line with Michael Furland that's a big question mark like he did play well for the first couple weeks or the last couple weeks of the season they have good chemistry but for a team going deep in the playoffs Furley's not a top line winner no and that's where you're getting into a little bit of a risk because if Furland struggles then oh crap we don't have two right wingers now that are legit top top three line wingers and then you're it, it becomes a desperate need at the trade deadline and personally i'm in favor of signing yager outright and just you know letting the chips fall where they may at the deadline and go from there so let me ask you a couple questions then the, the flames currently sit at 5.21 million dollars uh with cap space last year yager's cap hit was four million um, he made just over $5 million by the time you factor in performance bonuses. What would you offer Yager if you were the GM? Two and a half, three in that ballpark. Who does Yager displace in the lineup if you bring him in? Yeah. yeah. I think that, well, if you go based off of what I was saying earlier, then if you have Goudreau with Bennett and Furland on the the first line, then you could have Kachuk with Monahan and Yager as line two, Jankowski with uh, Backlund and Froelich, and then Versteeg on the line with, say, uh, Stajan and Brower, and that just pushes Lazar into the press box. Like, when I look at this forward group, I just don't see who... I mean, yeah, you could sit Lazar, but other than that, I don't really see who you take out of the lineup that the Flames would be willing to take out of the lineup. I mean, they're paying a lot of money to stage in. They're paying a lot of money to Brower. They're not going to want those guys to sit out. Is, I guess, yeah, Lazar's the logical option to come out then, but do the Flames really want to sit him? Well, alternatively, you could sit stage in and have Lazar be the third line or fourth line center, but, you know, it, it would create a little bit more depth overall up front and I think that would make the Flames probably the deepest team overall in the league so it's not how do you say it's not an urgent need for right now but we do have the cap space and why not to me I I know what you're saying about not bringing a guy into the deadline but I don't see the need right now to bring Yager and I'm 
comfortable enough with the lineup the way it sits today that I would say let's get through the first month of the season and let's reevaluate, you know, at the end of November, early December and see if there's still that need. And if we still think, you know what, we could use veteran presence, then go out and bring a guy like Yager in. Potentially. I just don't, I don't know. I think if we look at Yager, and I know a lot of people want to bring him in as a first-line winger, Mm -hmm. But, you know, he's getting older, and I don't think he's necessarily the first-line winger that the Flames need. That's the one big hole we have. But I think, honestly, Yager fits into your middle six line, either two or three. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, yeah, you're – with either Ginla or Yager, it'd be a depth signing, not having him out there as your first-line player. So I just I don't know how much benefit it brings. I mean, I guess for three million, if you could do that, that's not a bad signing for one year. But I think it's going to take more, like four, four and a half, to get them to come to Calgary. And I don't know if I'm willing for the Flames to use that much of their uh, their salary cap. Oh, for sure, and that it's one of those things that there are very valid points on all sides. Personally, I, I would prefer having Yager as a flame just due to the fact that hey that'd be cool but you know that's the fan in me the flames are trying to get people to buy these new jerseys that didn't change much I bet you could buy you could sell a lot of 68 jerseys oh for sure and you I don't think you're gonna sell too many Olas Matson jerseys though probably not but you know I think if Janko makes a team they'll sell some of those as well but they're expensive this year I don't know it's like 250 for a jersey crested well, Matt, let's talk a little bit about the final roster spots. So I think we'd all agree there's probably one spot in the top four lines available for a kid to take right now. Yeah, probably. And probably one defensive spot, maybe two, in the number six and maybe seven defensive spots. Again, yeah, probably. Um, so let, let's break these down. On the forward side, we talked earlier, number 77, Mark Jankowski. I think right now he's a shoe in He's the only guy showing that he should get that spot. Anyone else on the forward ranks that's still left at camp you think would get uh, get a look in the, I guess, on the opening day roster? If Dylan Dubé was a year older and needing to be assigned to Stockton, then I think he might have gotten a shot. But with him being junior eligible, eligible, go have fun down there and go enjoy your world junior spot and, you know, come make the team next year. So beyond that, not really. Like, you have depth forwards like Hathaway and Tanner Glass, possibly. But, nah, not really. You've been a Hathaway fan for a number of years now. Do you think that Hathaway makes the opening day roster? I do believe so, yes. I think he replaces Freddie Hamilton as the 13th forward. I don't know. I have to believe there's some sort of deal that Freddie stays up here for Dougie. I think we're probably going to run 14 forwards and have Freddie and Hathaway as the extra forwards. I can see that. I just don't know what benefit Hamilton gets from going to the AHL. Now, on the back end then, so there's potentially a 6-7 spot. You had an interesting idea this summer about uh, the number 7 spot that is probably worth sharing with everybody. Do you remember what you were saying in July about that spot? I think it was that uh, just having Matt Barkowski have the number 7 spot because he's the veteran guy, and if you have like a one of the defensemen just suffers like a minor nagging injury that just forces them out of the lineup for a game then you can just slide Barkowski in but if you have like say Giordano misses two weeks then you recall a prospect instead yeah I hadn't thought of it that way until you mentioned it and I think that's probably what they'll end up doing is Barkowski's good enough he can fill in for one game or if there's a back-to-back or something like that but I think that you know whoever doesn't make the team Kulak or Anderson is like you said that first call up and if there's anyone out for more than a game or two that guy get called up to take the spot i think bartkowski is really there is just the warm body the absolute last case yeah and like i wouldn't expect bartkowski to play more than like 10 games in the year and that's like worst case scenario um as for the who i think the number six guy will be at this point, I'd have to actually give it to Rasmus Anderson because of the fact that 
Kulak and Watherspoon played so poorly that I think they played themselves both out of contention of the spot, at least to start with. And while Barkowski hasn't been much better, at least he's cheap and you can throw him in as the number seven and he just is there. And at least with Anderson, he's, you know, he has room to grow. Yeah, and you don't want a guy like Anderson being your number seven. He needs to play. So if he's not going to play up here or Kulak, send him down to the AHL. The only downside is Kulak has to go through waivers, but I think this early in the season he'll clear. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, I'm going to go against what you say. I think that the coaching staff wants Kulak in that spot, and I think they're going to give it to Kulak, even though he hasn't looked great to start the season just because he's the older guy, he's 23, and I think you know we know that the coach is looking for the right-left shot pairings and Stone's a right shot. So I'm going to say that I think Kulak gets the number six spot to start the year. But I think that the coaching staff is going to tell him, you know what, Rasmus is knocking on the door, and you better, you know, keep this spot. Yeah, I could see that. I I personally don't have the same obsession with left right shots that the coaching staff seems to. So, you know, if you if you, but knowing that's important to the coaching staff, you kind of got to yeah. play into their mentality. I think that talent supersedes everything, and if. I would give basically Anderson and Kulak one more shot each in the last couple of preseason games. And whoever plays better wins the spot, basically. And Well, I think not just give him a, sp- a shot, but give oh, him yeah, a shot with sure. Stone to see who has the best chemistry with for that sure. partner. So that's my guess, is that Rasmus Anderson starts the season in Stockton. Uh, Brett Kulak starts the season in Calgary. We might see that change later on, but I think that that's what's going to happen for the number six spot. Um, just just a guess that I have based on the team's... The team gave Kulak a lot of rope last year, and I think they're going to do that again. You also mentioned Watherspoon. That's a weird signing to me. Like You and I were pretty sure he was done as a Calgary Flame after last year. And then they qualified him as an RFA and brought him back. And I still don't really fully understand that. I mean, I knew he wasn't going to make this team. I think that he's had enough shots and proven he can't do it. And at this point, he just becomes a veteran AHL hand. Yeah, and if you view him in that lens, then, you know, I don't know. I think it was a waste of a signing, personally. But, you know, it, the no. I don't think we ever see him. Uh, he has an NHL number, but I don't see, think we ever see him in an NHL jersey here in Calgary again. I would doubt it unless, like, three or four guys get hurt. In which case, you know, Watherspoon is, like, the least of our problems. Um, and then, obviously, on the goaltending side, we have John Gillies, Eddie Lack, and Mike Smith still at camp. Do you think there's any way at this point that John Gillies steals a job from Eddie Lack? Yes. Why not? If Lack has not played well in his two games, uh, Gillies played well in his appearances. If it continues, why not? You don't really... With uh, Lack, the team's only on the hook for like $1.3 million. So like if the Flames assign him to Stockton, they're really only on the hook for $400,000 in terms of the pro cap hit. And I can see him getting claimed, at which point they'd be on the hook for nothing. True. And Gillies has performed well, and I'd, again, give Gillies a shot, and if he plays well again, if he earns the spot, you know, that's the whole point of having competition. If you earn the spot, then it's yours. And Lack hasn't played well. Like, yesterday, he looked lost at half the time. You know, that's not something that inspires a lot of confidence. And when your goaltender gives up 10 goals in two games, it's like, I don't think we should have this goalie in net. So, you know, it's like every other spot. If they're not putting up, then go on to the next guy. And Gillies has played well. Lack hasn't. If that's what it comes down to, then good for Gillies. So let me ask you this then. How many games do you think Mike Smith gets this year? I would say in the 55-60 range. So let's just go with, let's split it, let's go 60. So do you think Gillies can do 20 games? Sure, why not? 
I mean, I guess I, I'm thinking Smith is going to do more like 50, and I feel more confident with Lack getting 30 starts than I do with Gillies getting 30 starts. Yeah. Uh, I th- If Gillies continues to play well, I would have no problem with him. Because that's the other problem that the Flames have. Between having Gillies, Riddich, and Parsons, they're all coming up relatively at the same time and you need to try these guys out at the nhl level to know whether or not they're actually nhl goaltenders so that also becomes a factor as well and knowing is gillies a legitimate potential starter or is he going to be the eventual backup for parsons or riddich you know what i mean like it i think i mean gillies has been around Gilly's been around since 2012. I think by this point they know what they've got from him. They see his preseason games. I'm just not comfortable with him playing 30 games. I mean, maybe we bring him up after the deadline, but I'm more comfortable with Lack shouldering that load. I'm the opposite, actually. I'm more comfortable with Gilly, so we'll see. Uh, that'll be pretty much the main question over the last handful of days. And that might be yours in my state. I mean, don't get me wrong. I think Gillies has NHL potential. I'm just not sure that on a contending team, this is the year for it. And he's lost a year of his development, too, so I'd have no problem sending him back down for one more. Oh, no, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if he went to Stockton, but it wouldn't hurt either if he played in Calgary. So we'll We'll see. see. We'll see what happens. So, Matt, there's still a few uh, part-time tryout agreements, guys who are on PTOs at camp. Most notably, we have Joseph Cramarosa. We have uh, Tanner Glass. Those are the two that everybody's been talking about. Do you think there's much of a chance that either guy gets a Flames contract? I wouldn't be disappointed if the Flames signed Glass. I think he's done his job effectively. And sometimes you do need that toughness at the NHL level. Fighting hasn't gone out of the game entirely, and he hasn't looked bad. You know, you're you're not expecting him to be super amazing, awesome, or anything. It's just he does his job, sort of like what McGratton used to do, where just he does his job well, and he also is willing to drop the gloves. And, you know, he's a fighter who can play a bit. Now, is he very good? No. But if you're using him sparingly only against teams that have that, it helps serve as a deterrent so that way they're not running around with the other guys on your team. So I wouldn't be opposed to him. Cramarosa, he's been okay, but I don't think he's done enough to earn a spot. I can see Cramarosa get an AHL deal. but I, I do too. I don't think he's worth spending one of the Flames contracts on. No. I think Tanner Glass, he has looked good. Uh, he's been awarded number 51 for those who have been watching on TV. I know the new numbers are weird for some people. Um, I think he's looked good. He's 33. I mean, he's got some experience. I think I'd sign him and immediately send him to the AHL. I think that they could probably use that veteran presence down there, and he's one of these guys you call up when you need it. I mean, if Hathaway is going to be on the opening day roster. Well, at that rate, I think you, you could just have Gazdick, who they did sign for the AHL, and just recall him instead. Yeah, I don't know. I could see having both of them down there. I think if you sign Glass, Hathaway doesn't make the team. Yeah, I can see that, yeah. You you know, like if you send Glass down with Gazdick, you've got two bruisers down in the A. But I I just, I don't see, I mean, if we're saying that Hamilton and Hathaway are the 13th, 14th forwards, you can't carry any more than that with the roster we've laid out. So who well, doesn't make the team? Well, frankly, if it was up to me, I'd keep Glass and move Freddie back to Stockton, but that's... Yeah, I don't see it happening. No. I I agree with you. I don't think Freddie's the right guy, but I just I think he stays up here for Dougie. Yeah. I won't make my Douglas joke again. Um, And maybe that changes during the season. I mean, you know, a guy like Hathaway does have to clear waivers. I, I don't know if he'd get claimed or not. I don't think he would. Um, but, yeah, I mean, maybe it's okay send Hathaway down and put Glass in that role. I just think Glass will look good, but I don't know if he's looked good enough to take, again, on a very tight forward lineup, I don't know if he's looked good to take somebody good enough to take somebody's job. So I think I would probably pass on Glass at this point. And if there's a an injury later in the season, you could always sign him then. But 
you know, I don't think glass is going to be in high demand from any team. No. Um, as far as you mentioned Gazdick earlier, Gazdick was signed in a similar role to glass. And in some ways I wish the flames would have passed on Gazdick and brought glass in, but, um, Gazdick, you think he starts in the A? Oh, for sure. He's, I think he's our next, um, he's our next bow league. Yeah. He'll be down there. The only, the only thing I could see about Gazdick or glass is, Goudreau got pushed around by some teams like the Ducks last year, and I could see calling one of those guys up when we play some of those kind of teams just to sort of be there to enforce order. Yeah. I agree. I don't, I don't think you bring him up for more than a couple games. Oh, no. Well, Matt, anything else about training camp you want to talk about, um, you know, throw back and forth before we start looking at some other flame stuff from the summer? No, I'm just looking forward to the last couple of games just to see – who makes which of the final spots and looking forward to the October 4th, I do believe it is. So we'll see. It's going to, it's going to be fun. And I think the next couple uh preseason games, we're going to see a very veteran laden roster. Yeah. And we get right off the bat, a game in Anaheim in the second week of the season. So, you know, if ever you're going to get the monkey off the back, Hey, here's a good time. We've been doing the show. This is our sixth season now, and I think every year we've said it's the year, it's the year, it's time to break the curse. So I think this year I'm going to say we don't break the curse, and maybe then we'll break it. Well, honestly, the in order for the Flames to be a contender, a legitimate Stanley Cup contender, they have to win a game in Anaheim. Period. And I, I can't really take them seriously as a actual Stanley Cup threat because of the fact that it's in our division and we're likely going to have to play them at some point in the playoffs. And if you can't beat them, that's going to stick in your head. And like last year where the Flames were the better team for most of the games and yet found ways to lose. And it if they don't get that monkey off their back, it'll hang over them like a black cloud uh, and it's so silly because <laughs> like most of the players weren't even here uh, like it's getting to the point where some of them won't be alive by the time <laughs> you know what i mean like sam bennett jr will be on the team when we eventually break the streak yeah exactly like it's getting to that point where like we're hitting the 18 mark you know so we we can start taking bets on the show what comes first jankowski retires or the flames win in anaheim yeah <laughs> Well, hopefully it's the Flames winning in Anaheim in a couple of weeks, and then we can stop talking about it. But then what are we going to talk about? It's one of our storylines every year, Matt. Well, I think you and I can find something to do. You know. We'll find out. It's bo- we'll, pro- we'll probably win in Anaheim and not be able to win a game in Vegas. Yeah, probably. We'll probably lose every game to Vegas like they did with the losing to the Sharks a couple of times in the, their first season. And that'll become the new Honda Center. It's like, we can't beat the Golden Knights in Vegas. What's wrong? Well, I think, like, uh, we've always kind of sucked in Anaheim. Like, I, I think the Flames only have, like, seven wins there all time. And it's like they were bad for the first handful of years, and yet we still couldn't beat them there. Just a weird thing i'm just hoping that that goes away (laughs) we'll see we'll make that one of our storylines to watch this coming year well let's sort of go backwards chronologically and talk about some of the flames news from over the summer um the flames didn't really sign any big contracts i mean there's nothing done july 1st nothing of note i think the biggest contract of note was the sam bennett signing that happened late in august uh before we got that done maybe even early september i'd have to go back and check but the, I was surprised by this deal. We saw, you know, some posturing back and forth. We saw the rumors that Bennett's people said he'd go to the KHL if he couldn't get a deal or go play in Europe somewhere. And we ended up getting a deal done at a two-year deal, $1.95 million per year. Did this term or money surprise you? The money sure did. I was expecting two and a half to three. So I think it's partially put up because of the fact that, you know, He's not had the best of seasons the last two years. And 
also a competitive edge contract where for the two years he's making a little less but that also gives the flames more flexibility to go out and acquire other players so and with uh kachuk and bennett both expiring after next season that will also force some interesting maneuvers in order to be cap compliant then yeah i mean we're gonna have you know stages three and a half come off the books um you know we got to resign backland as well but yeah there's gonna have to be some a few interesting maneuvers made to me when i look at this right now i pencil bennett in as the third line center for the start of the season and he's getting paid third line center money yeah thereabouts you know, I mean, 1.9, he's one of the lowest paid forwards on the team. The only guys making less are Versteeg, Furland, Lazar, Kachuk, and Hamilton. Um, but I think that if, you know, as you were mentioning earlier, I think if Bennett can prove himself to be sort of a top center for us, either a number one or number two with Goudreau, I think these two years could look like a heck of a value for the Flames. Oh, for sure. If he puts up 40, 50, 60 points in either season, like that's a joke so So Matt let me run something crazy by you that I've been talking to some fans that I've been talking to lately about with a reasonable contract like 1.95 million and with some centermen like Jankowski knocking on the door do you think part of this could be that you know what this contract makes it easier either this year or next year for the Flames to unload Bennett for some assets I wouldn't I just simply wouldn't you don't trade good centers unless you absolutely need to and like it usually it they any centers with any quality get traded only once in a blue moon and usually it's a trade that either the guy is a head case or it's looked back upon as being like a really boneheaded trade like uh the Sagan trade um the one where it the guy was a bit of a head case, that's, of course, the Ryan Johansson for Seth Jones deal. That, those are the only real examples of anybody with quality that get moved. And, it, like, if Bennett doesn't show any quality beyond being a third-line player, then you're not really... There's not really going to be a ton of demand for him as a player either there's always that gm that wants a reclamation project but they're not gonna overpay no no and at that rate you might as well just keep them as a middling depth piece instead of whatever frivolity you're going to get in return i mean looking at sort of the money that's coming off the books i like that bennett signed two years and he's still an rfa that gives the flames some you know leverage and some leeway with the next contract as far as, you know, arbitration and that sort of thing. But I think that if you look at what Stajan's making at 3.15, I think we'll probably see that money get funneled into a Bennett contract. Partially, at least. I think uh, a Backland contract is likely going to be in the five and a half, six range. And so that'll be a bump up of about $2 million. So I think that'll eat a good portion of uh Stajan's contract but I think that like after the two years are up I think guys like Froelich and Brower start to get moved in some way shape or form and it, hopefully guys like Fu and or others start pushing into actual lineup spots but that's a conversation for episode 180 90 200 something like that Next year. Yeah. Um, another quick signing I'll say that I was happy with is Chris Versteeg. I was glad to get him back. I think 1.75 is reasonable for him on a one-year. Versteeg seems thrilled to be here, and I think he's going to play a bigger part in this lineup this yeah, year. I, I'm just hoping that his injury troubles that hampered him last year are gone uh, or minimized and that he can... And if not, that could be a spot for one of the kids on the sure. farm to jump so, in. We'll see. At 1.75, we can afford for him to be hurt for half Oh, for sure. And you're paying him, like, on aggregate for how much he plays. Because he'd be a 3000000 million-ish player otherwise. So, we'll see. Um, any other notable contracts you want to talk about? No, just uh, 
looking forward to seeing if any additional contracts will be signed before the start of the season, whether that's PTOs or Yager. Yeah. Well, then let's shift gears a bit. You and I talked last year as we were leading up to the trade deadline and then also as we led up to the expansion draft about the possibility. I mean, we knew the Flames need a goaltender. We knew that Elliot wasn't going to be the guy long term and he was expiring. And we talked about the rumor that's been thrown around a lot of Marc-Andre Fleury coming to Calgary and what would that look like. And we had polarizing opinions on that. Over the summer, Eric Francis posted an article talking to Fleury where Fleury said he probably would have waived his no trade clause to come here and I mean there's again people have different thoughts on I still think personally Fleury would be a good goaltender here if you look at him and Smith and sort of that same role similar age but when I started looking at it I think you really have to look at it if you would either have Fleury or you'd have Smith and Hamannick if we look at what we would have given up and that's what I've been asking myself is what would we have given up to get Smith I think it would be those two. If we look at Smith, we gave up Hickey, Johnson, and a conditional third-round pick, which becomes a second if the Flames make the playoffs. And Hamannick, we gave up a first, a second, and another conditional second. So let's break this down a bit. Matt, do you think that's probably a fair assessment that it would either be Flurry or Smith and Hamannick? You probably couldn't have Flurry and Hamannick. Probably. Uh, I think that you could possibly get Hamannick as well but you would have lost anderson or shillington or some other high quality player so yeah i think i think the return that we gave up for hamannick is pretty much the return we would have had to give up for flurry yeah more or less so i mean with that in mind as much as i thought that well, flurry would be a good fit here oh sorry go ahead yeah well that's the thing honestly one for one i'd rather have smith than flurry so I am really definitely not opposed to how things shook out. I'm not opposed to Smith. I don't know enough about Smith to know if if this is going to be the right move. I mean, he's a veteran goaltender. The organization is familiar with him. But I think that to me, even as someone who is very high on bringing Fleury in, I think the Hamannick portion of that really makes it worth the Smith acquisition. I'm not saying Smith's a bad goalie. I just would have rather had Fleury. Yeah. Um, but I think that Hamannick is is going to really shore up something we need here. It's a partner for Brody and another long-term piece. I mean, you know, our top 5D is stacked this year. And yeah. and I think something you've got to give to get, and the Hamannick makes sense. Yeah. Well, for me personally, I don't like Marc-Andre Fleury as a goaltender. I like him as a person. He's a, a wonderful guy. But I honestly think that if the Penguins had – a different starter and you can insert any middling starter in the NHL instead of Marc-Andre Fleury I think that Cam Talbot no I'm not even saying like I'm saying like guys from like years gone by like Marty Turco say just middling guys nothing special I honestly think the Penguins have five six seven cups right now instead of three and I think it's because of how bad Flurry played in the playoffs. And seeing how we had such a great time with Brian Elliott's <laughs> goaltending performance, that's basically what Flurry was like most of the time in the playoffs. And like there were seasons where like the Penguins were the overwhelming favorite and Flurry would give up seven goals and it's like, uh, what are you doing? And you know, it do you think the team was good in spite of their goalie? Well, it's not really a surprise that they got Matt Murray in there. And I like Murray, but he's not Carey Price. He's a top 10 goalie, but he's not that good. But they won the cup twice in a row because of him. Because their team was solid enough. And I think that the last two years, Penguins teams are not remarkable compared to the ones from the last, like, since 2008. And I think that a lot of that has to do with how, the poor goaltending of Marc-Andre Fleury. So the fact that the Flames didn't get him, that's fine by me. You know, I... It, and again, I like Fleury. Great guy. You know, it, perfect teammate. Just a horrible starting goaltender. And... Then on top of it, you have Mike Smith, who's a very good passing goaltender. He tried where, to score in one game already. 
Yeah, and you look at teams, like with the Flames' defensive system, we our guys try to confront the opposition forwards at the blue line to get them to chip the puck in or beat them one-on-one. And most of the time, the players chip the puck in because it's easier than trying to beat the defender one-on-one. Well, in years past, Elliot and uh, Johnson, not very good in that regard for passing the puck. But if a guy dumps the puck in, Mike Smith's just going to get it and whip it right back out. And if you're starting a partial line change, that could lead to some breakaways and, well, likely goals eventually. So, and like uh, Treliving was making a comment about uh, Mike Stone. He was saying that um, Stone, was, uh, initially when he came to Calgary, had to start going and getting the puck himself. And he wasn't used to that. And he was getting hit more often and because of the fact that he had to go and retrieve the puck himself. Because he was used to Mike Smith dump passing him the puck and so that'll also help on the wear and tear front for the defenseman because they'll have less to do because he's such a good passer that it will help generate the offense overall now smith is a wildly inconsistent goaltender at times and like he will give up some bad goals when he gets caught cheating out of the net well, again, that's why but, I think that Smith needs somebody solid as a backup. Like, I think that's... Yeah, but like on the aggregate, like overall, I think Smith contributes more to the offense than any bad goals against, even though it'll be frustrating when, you know, oh, great, you know, he's behind the net and the puck is in front and there you go. <laughs> but, you know, don't be too hard on him when, you know, or give credit where credit's due when he makes a gr- great pass to the other blue line for a breakaway. So, because he can do that, and it's he's one of the few goalies in the league that can do that. And especially with the Flames transition game, that will be a good overlap. And I think you know, in some ways, it's almost comparing apples to oranges because, as far as we knew, Smith wasn't available last year. It's not as though the Flames made you know a flurry or Smith decision. It was okay. Flurry's off the table. Now who do we go after? Not saying Smith was plan B, but, you know, I think that they weren't together last year. And if we had the choice, I probably wouldn't have been so high on Flurry. but he seemed like the best option at the time. Yeah, and you also have to look at Mike Smith's stats, which aren't particularly stellar, but then you got to realize that... No, but he hasn't played on a great team either. Yeah, that's the point I'm trying to make is that boy, the Arizona Coyotes are terrible. And, you know, there's only so much that one man can do. And Smith is a good goalie that's just been stuck on some really lousy Coyotes teams. And, yeah, it's not so good. I almost wonder so, if the Flames make it a condition when they sign a guy like Stone or Smith that we're going to save you from Arizona, but you've got to take a pay cut on your next contract as, you know, the condition of us doing that. Yeah. The save me from the desert. <laughs> Pretty much. How Plus. much is it worth you to be saved? Yes. Million bucks? Two million bucks? Name your price. Yeah. We can make the deal. You just got to name your price. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't think Smith is going to be a bad goalie for us. I think especially compared to the goaltending we've had the last couple of years, he'll definitely be, um, you know, a good goaltender. Mm-hmm. But... Compa- no, and like if you look at Smith, some games like it, it, when watching the Coyotes, like he'd make 47, 48 saves and the Coyotes would actually win the game and it, because of him. It's just there are also some games where he gives up four goals on 10 shots. And so it'll be interesting. I think, I looking, think it, looking at it as an aggregate for me between Smith, Lack, and Hamannick, I'd rather have that trio than I would just flurry yeah so would i and i don't think you get lack if you bring in flurry i think gillies probably would have got that backup job probably and like you're saying you know smith isn't as consistent that's why i think you do need that more seasoned goaltender as the backup guy who can come in and relieve smith well matt you know what that brings us to arena discussion 
Super fun, awesome finances. I know everyone's probably going to hate us. This has been raging <laughs> in the news lately, but you know it's a Flames issue, so we got to cover it. Um, yeah. I don't want to get into numbers and all that, but you know everyone can go online, see the two proposals for what the city proposed, what the Flames proposed. Overall, you don't have to say which side that you side with if you don't want to, but as far as how this was handled, I mean, Ken King pretty much coming out and saying during an election campaign that, okay, the city's decided to stop talking or the Flames decided to stop talking to the city and, you know, pretty much we're not getting anywhere. How do you think this... This doesn't seem like the way the Flames usually handle their business. Well, I think that it comes largely from frustrations over Calgary Next and the failure of it. And I think that partially it's we really wanted that to be the arena district and hey that'd be really cool and you guys aren't playing ball so let's you know hope see if we can get somebody else and maybe there is some movement there it's not uh, the way i personally would have handled it i don't think it was a mature decision by the flames to do that it but also i have to say that it wasn't a mature decision by Nenshi either to bring up the victoria park proposal either in the midst of and it's kind of like it as ken king did say like it if Nenshi hadn't brought it up i don't think the flames would have brought their frustrations up but it's like it if you're on think of law shows where the prosecutor asks a question and he opens the door and then the defense attorney picks it apart well it, i think that ninchi opened the door and then the flames kind of made a mess of it <laughs> see what i so. think is what i think is fascinating about even that logic is the way that the i think the public's opinion is swayed and i think it's so different than what the flames expected i think the flames were expecting everyone was going to go yeah we need a new arena you know we should we need to talk to the flames we need to get this done but i think once the city unveiled their proposal from everyone i've talked to people seem to be siding with the city yeah and how would you say it? the city does have to move a little bit like realistically with all buildings like that usually the city's on the hook for 50 to 75 million dollars maybe more maybe less but generally in that ballpark of funds that they do not recover at all and remember these normal... negotiations right this is where oh, both yeah. sides start and there's always a medium so i don't think anyone's saying the city expected to get this or the flames expect to get exactly this these are two sides to a negotiation yeah, and you have to figure that in terms of, in because Calgary doesn't get very many big name concerts because the Saladome is terrible for acoustics, that that would be an added benefit financially to the are to the city because of that, where the Flames or the city is not getting those revenues right now, which with other places one of the arguments is that well you're not seeing any actual benefit in terms of revenue to the city but that it's a little different here because the flames do not have a legitimate proper venue for concerts and then they would be getting one so that would help to pay for things over time and it's one of those things that like the flames they do have some gripes that are legitimate and the city has some gripes that are legitimate and like with all things it's a matter of finding an equitable middle ground to make things work and like the flames are losing revenue that they could get if they had more luxury boxes because you gotta figure if they had an extra section of luxury suites around the dome they could probably get eight ten million dollars a year from that and that's just added revenue which wouldn't impact the amount of seats in the building just added boxes so you know it's one of those things where like the, each side has value valid thoughts it's just 
it was not handled well by anybody pretty much and the city handled it less bad <laughs> it's sort of like our anderson kulak discussion well anderson's done less bad so you know he gets the spot well the city's done less bad so that's where my opinion's going to them maybe that's how you get the city to build the arena if you promise to chip in money towards a new arena they'll keep you on the team yeah <laughs> i'll donate half my contract towards a new arena keep me in calgary yeah. Um, and like the disingenuous nature of like the ticket tax being revenue that's coming from the flames well yeah technically the flames could charge that extra eight ten twelve dollar usage fee but it once the actual amount is paid back it, it's not like the flames are just magically going to not like drop the ticket well, prices that's, that's by the exactly 12 dollars so you know like they're just delaying that revenue coming in and you got to figure if you're having lots of people in attendance both between the flames the roughnecks the hitmen concerts this that the next thing like that couple hundred million dollars is gonna get paid back fairly quickly probably eight ten years and then after that that eight ten twelve dollars is in your pocket forever so it's one of those things that you know and you look at edmonton they raise their ticket prices significantly on top of that as well so it's not like the flames are going to be hurting for money getting a new building it's just they didn't handle it well at I th all. I think we have to remember new buildings are not a profit center. You hardly ever make money with a new building. It's, no. You know, all the things you can do inside the building and, you know, all the, like you said, the concerts that won't pass us by. And I mean, if they're trying to make a profit on this building, they're not going to see that for years. Where I think the discussion hasn't been that it needs to be is not just on the arena itself, but sort of the, and I don't want to use the term ice district like Edmonton has, but the auxiliary area around the arena you know with calgary next there was the proposal of a hotel and all these other things and i think that and that's a good thing like you want to have people actually go to the area and stay in the area like not sure. just you know like after the game go to the bar across the street or whatever or if you don't have but, tickets to the game, go to the bar that's, you know, in the... I could see Flame Central being moved to the arena. Like, it's on the ground floor of the arena. So you're going down there, whether they have tickets to the game or not. And I think that's where some of this revenue can come from that's not being talked about. The more businesses move yeah. in, the more taxes there are, the more property tax there is. And that's where I think that, you know, some of the money doesn't necessarily have to come from the arena itself generating money, but from some of these businesses in the auxiliary area and sort of revitalizing some of that space that now isn't the most desirable place in the city. I know, and it's not like the Saddle Dome where it's an arena and parking lots. And a casino. You know. Oh, gee, that's, you know. Like, Don't forget the Agricultural there. Center. Oh, yes, I forgot about that. Or the old Big Four building. You know, like... Like, I can understand why the Flames are reticent about that because they don't want to have a repeat. Because, like, initially when the Saladome was being built, they were supposed to build around it. But then the oil fell out in the 80s and Alberta's economy went in the tank and they didn't actually get around to doing any of those things. And it took until, like, I think 2007 for things to start getting built in that area and it's just yeah a complete mess so i can understand why like they want to have it as part of a cool district and place to go it's just working on all those fun details to get it to work yeah it'll i think we need to wait and see i mean i think the flames wanted to make this an election issue which it really hasn't become yet, but I think when the Flames say they're done talking, that'll change with a new city council. I yeah, do want to... and you also got to figure that there's Olympic bids and the like, and World Cup of Soccer and a handful of other things that are coming up where the Flames and the city are both in talks to actually host those things, like, say, in 2026. Well, I think an Olympic bid would force our hand. 
Yeah, and that's the thing, like, where, okay, we don't have the funds right now, but hey, we're hosting the Olympics. Let's have, you know, get the federal government to help chip in. Okay, sure. And, you know, that's a uh, feasibility as well. And I mean, you know, in that case too, you'd get private business and all sorts of places oh, to yeah. chip in. Oh, for sure. And that's why I don't think that we'll see the building until probably 24, but... We'll see. I, I I don't have any doubt that the Flames will stay in Calgary or that the arena will get built. It's just trying to make things work. And right now it's being a little difficult. But, you know, we're at the starting point. It's not the end point. So, you know, it's always a bit of a nuisance, especially on the fans. But everybody's talking about it now, and that's when we couldn't say about Calgary next. Flames fans were talking about it, but now, I mean, I can go anywhere in the city. And people who know I'm a podcaster for the Flames are talking to me about the arena. And I think, like you said, this is the beginning. This is now making it an awareness to all Calgarians. And I think there's going to be now more pressure to let's sit down and hammer this out. Yeah. Uh, like, I wouldn't be surprised if over the next two, three years, as things start to get intense and like with the Olympic bid, that things will start to get hammered out and especially if the flames or the city wins the olympic bid then for sure the arena is going to be done in no time so we'll see it it's i wouldn't worry about it so the one thing i hear a lot from fans is oh the flames are going to move and no. i just wanted to sort of point out the history of relocation in the nhl i mean there's teams that need to relocate there's teams out there um you know, well, look at look at the last three relocations. You had Winnipeg, small city, no revenue, bad Canadian dollar, and they tried they tried to keep them there, it, and then they moved them to Arizona, Col Quebec. They tried to keep them in Quebec, and similarly, bad Canadian dollar, small city, ended up getting relocated to Colorado, then. Atlanta, they tried to keep the ownership group did not want the team, but they had to take it with the basketball team and the arena. And they tried to get rid of the team for seven years and they couldn't get rid of the team. And eventually, after seven years, the finally the NHL relented and they moved. Now, you also got to figure that the Flames are one of the top. 10 12 teams revenue wise anywhere that they move in the states is going to be an immediate drop in revenue it does not matter where you go it's going to be a drop if they move to re relocate to quebec city it, again you're going from a city that's about one four one five million people down to like i think eight hundred nine hundred thousand again you're going to see the revenue drop so there's no real financial long-term incentive for the Flames to move. And if the Flames moved instantaneously, like Carolina or New Jersey or any of those other teams that are kind of on the shaky zone would be relocated to Calgary because financially it makes sense. So it's just a lot of nonsense and... I'm not worried at all about a rebuild or a relocation. I'm so. worried about a rebuild. If we're rebuilding again, we're screwed. Oh yeah, but especially with the Flames going into contender mode, like them being a Stanley Cup contender for the next few years, like uh, that's gonna also boost the ability to get the arena built. And you know, I think if you look at this city, I mean, let's look at the NHL first. There's been one relocation in the last 20 years, and there's Atlanta to Winnipeg. There's a lot of teams that need to move before we do. I think if you're an investor in Seattle or Quebec, you're going to take on a team like um, Carolina. Carolina or yeah. you know, Arizona. especially with Carolina looking like a good team on top of it, like sort of like Quebec City was when they moved to Colorado. And the, and the league is going to try and move the teams with need first, and that's the biggest need. So, you know, Calgary's not going anywhere, and this city has deep pockets. I mean, there's a lot of investors in this city that I think, let's just say the team was for sale. I wouldn't be surprised if another group of people stepped up and said, you know what, we're going to keep the team here. Oh, yeah. Like, if the team, yeah, oh, for sure. No, I, there's enough people. I mean, you know, we've got 
big name. I mean, I could even see somebody like Brett Wilson, you know, famous Calgary millionaire from Dragon's Den, owns a part of, I think, the the Predators. Like, you know, I could see him in a group step up, or there's a lot of people who could step up. Where the hell is Paul Silly now with the last of his BlackBerry money? Like, there's enough people, I think, who would see Calgary, even if they're not from Calgary, see that Calgary's a good hockey market for this team, and it's worth the investment. So if any if anyone thinks the Flames are going anywhere, they're not going anywhere. This team's going to be around for as long as long as you can think of. Yeah, these this team will sure. be here for your kids to see. Maybe even your grandkids. They're not moving anywhere, Matt. As they move next year, no. Um, <laughs> so you know, we will try not to talk much yeah, about I the know. arena during the season unless something big happens, but. It's becoming a piece that people are talking about, and we'll see as we move towards the election in October what happens with the arena talk. And I think it's going to heat up a little bit as we get towards the debates and that sort of thing. The last thing I want to talk about is an interview with Glenn Gullitson over the summer. And you guys can hear it if you go to the Calgary Flames website and go to the Calgary Flames TV section. Um, but just some interesting notes from that. And I'll kind of go through these one, I'll go through all of these, and then we'll break them down one at a time. Uh, Gullitson thought that Hamilton was probably the most improved player from last season. He also talked about Michael Backlund, saying that he underappreciated Backlund as a two-way player when he was an opposition coach. He didn't realize how good Backlund really was. He thinks Sam Bennett could be the player to watch this year. He thinks Sam Bennett might be the guy we see most improvement in. And at the time, he was saying that Hathaway, Jankowski, Shillington, Anderson, and Valamaki are guys he expect to compete for a spot. So let's break these four topics down. Would you disagree that Hamilton was most improved last year? Not at all. Uh, he still has a way to go, I think, to be the number one guy. But, yeah. He's, but he also doesn't need to be that guy yet. I know. But, you know, I'm saying that there's still some improvement that he could make. But overall, yeah, he's perfectly good. So anytime you have a young defenseman like that putting up those kind of numbers, you can't really complain. I mean, he got 50 points in 81 games last year. Like you said, there's still room to go up. I think that every year this is looking like a better and better trade, this Hamilton trade. And if we see Hamilton get as much better as he did the year before to last year, I think we're going to see a, a much improved Hamilton playing with Geo this year. And I think he could be, again, the new core piece to the Flames blue line. I agree. Um, let's talk about Backlund. So, you know, talking about how underutilized he was, and you and I have talked about Backlund in the past and how the Flames sort of had to reshift their expectations on well, Backlund, that he's not a sniper. He is that two-way guy. Yeah, well, Backlund, he was always a very smart and cerebral player, and his offensive game didn't seem to translate until recently. And that's the difference. And, like, if he's a 30-point player, then, okay, yeah, he's a very smart two-way center, but as a depth guy. And Backlund's starting to show that, hey, maybe he can be a good second-line center, low-end first-line center. And we'll have to see how that turns out. And... I just hope he has another good season, and I hope that he's a flame for another five, six years after this. Yeah, I mean, there were times in the last couple of seasons fans were saying it's time to cut bait, it's time to move Backland. I think that, like you said, we're really starting to see who Backland is. And realistically, yeah, and realistically, if he's the 30-point Backland, then you could replace him. Like, it would hurt, but you could find a viable replacement. But the... 45 50 point backland that that's a whole different animal there and you know uh, that's a you're talking about like a patrice bergeron light and it, that's like a completely different thing a sulky candidate and you know that's vastly different conversation than <laughs> you know a 30 point player well i'm talking about a potential 50 point player i think the next guy that we mentioned sam bennett I think there could be a conversation down the road of we keep one and we have to move the other. And with the coach thinking that Bennett could be the most improved player, I think that's kind of interesting. This is the guy we've seen who's already got a playoff beard in the preseason. He looks like he's ready to go. 
Yeah, well, you and I ran into Bennett a couple games ago, and we were giving him some, uh, giving him a little bit of a hard time. He's got so. a pl- he's got a playoff beard, and the season hasn't started yet. Yeah, well, we were saying to him that, uh, you know, is he going to go for the ZZ Top look? So that'll be interesting to see. I still think you should braid it, and then somebody can grab it in the corner. Can you get two minutes for holding the beard? Well, it it is a Viking style, so you know it's not unmanly. I'm just I'm different. That's all. I'm encouraged by the coach saying he thinks Bennett could be the most improved player this year. Obviously, there's a little bit of a mental aspect of this of him coming out and trying to put Bennett on the spot. But I think this has to be a breakout year for Bennett. I mean, he's on a contract where he has to show he can do this if he wants to get a bigger contract. And we've already seen some good chemistry between between him and Goudreau. I think he could really be the surprise this year. I agree with the, with uh, Gullison. Yep, and uh, it's up to him, really. And I, one of the things that you said earlier is like picking one or the other. Honestly, if need be, get rid of Frolik or Brower or a handful of other players and keep the depth in the center. Like I'd rather cheap out on the wingers and throw guys like Shin Carrick in there than get rid of the strength up the middle, because that's always the hardest thing to find. I think and if you gonna... got if you have three good ones or four good ones, hey, awesome! You're like the only team in the league that has that, so keep it. <laughs> I think Bennett's in an odd situation this year too, where I think he will for most of the season end up being that center sort of sandwich in the lineup between Backlund and Jankowski. So I think he has to show he's better than Jankowski and, you know, that he can get to a new level to not be a bottom six uh, centerman. So I think this is really a a proving ground for him this year. Without some of the pressure he might have had in the past, I think he's not going to be looked at to produce as much as he might have in the past. We've got guys like Achuk, Monaghan, Goudreau, who can do a lot of the goal scoring for us. So I think this is a low-pressure year for Backlund. Better, yeah. Yeah. Um, We'll see. And the last one here that I thought was interesting is the coach talking about Hathaway, Jankowski, Shillington, Anderson, and Valimaki's guys competing for spots. I mean, we talked earlier about Hathaway, Jankowski, and Anderson potentially making the team. What do you make of uh, Shillington and Valimaki as guys who might have made the team? Well, I can see it. Uh, it. You know, a true competition, you have those guys, all of them played well. And I thought Shillington was cut a little earlier than he needed to be, but... They probably need some bodies in the Stockton camp. True. And Valimaki, if he was 19, I think he might have had a shot. But, he, you know, he, he's just drafted, so no need to rush him. But I think the other three make the team, so... Yeah. When, uh, the, when we drafted Anderson and Shillington, I thought at first Shillington was going to be the guy that sort of leaped over Anderson on the depth chart, especially because we've seen Anderson with some conditioning issues at camp the last couple of years and that sort of thing. So I think it's a credit to Rasmus Anderson that he's jumping ahead of Shillington at this point. Um, but, you know, I kind of expected there's either going to be Kulak or Shillington coming in. Valimaki to me, I almost look at as the Mark Jankowski of defenseman. I think he's a good prospect, but he's a few years out before we need him to be ready or before he's, you know, going to be where we want him to be as a as a top line defenseman. So I think he's a guy that maybe needs a little bit more runway. Yeah. And it's one of those situations where um like when Bennett and Kachuk's contracts are up and the Flames like say they need to throw 12 million dollars at the two of them cuz that could happen. Uh, you may end up seeing a guy like Mark Giordano having to get traded, in which case you need guys like Shillington Anderson and Valimaki by then to step up into spots. And by then you're hoping that like Hamilton, Brody, Hamanick, and Stone are able to hold the fort if that's how it goes. So, we'll see. It it's it. I'm hoping that those guys continue to perform well and not flame out a bit like some of the other higher end prospects that have been not doing so well i think shillington is one of these guys the flames have a decision to make this year i think if they're not looking at him as a guy you could potentially make the nhl now is the time to maybe move him for some value 
Actually, with him, if he doesn't cut it as a defenseman, make him into a forward. We've got so much forward depth as it is. Not really. If you discount Shin Carrick, Poirier, and Klimchuk, you've got Dubé, Manjapani, and Fu. Yeah, that's but you're it. Gonna, I mean, looking at this roster, though, we're not like, going to have three spots open next year. No, but Shillington has enough offensive skill where you could make him a forward. Okay. So. I also think with guys like Adam Fox coming down the pipe, you know, guys like Shillington are going to have to show what they've got, and now is their time to do that. Yeah, and that's why like a guy like Shillington does have that unusual flexibility where he's a better offensive player than he is a defensive player, which is weird for a defenseman. And like honestly, I think Shillington, if he became a forward, could be a fifty-point player. That's how much offensive talent he has. It's just his mental thinking at times is suspect defensively, and that's. Yeah, ideally you'd like to have it all where you have a really dynamite TJ Brody-esque guy as your defenseman, but we'll see. I think if he's going to become a forward, I think you see him more in a Bufflin-like role where he can play either defense or forward, and I don't think there's enough yeah. of those guys out there. I don't think you take a guy like him and say, you know, we're never playing you on the blue line again, you're now a forward. And and I think that part yeah. of the reason Bufflin's lasted so long is his versatility. Yeah, and Brent Burns is another, and I think that you could have Shillington do that because it. it I will, I'm not normally a fan of doing that. Like usually, it's pick your spot and you're good, but Shillington's a bit weird because of how good he is offensively. That there is that flexibility there. I wouldn't rec. Didn't you suggest we do that with England too? No, I. Uh, that's different. I was because uh, uh, of the fact that he's a fighter, and you could just stick him on the fourth line in that role. That's different, though. Okay. Not, I'm not usually a fan of like offensive defensemen being converted to forwards, but Shillington's unusual in that regard. And that might be something that gives him a new lease on life if he's finding that he's not cutting it on the blue line or not as high up on the depth chart as he wants. Yeah, because his offensive that. instincts have always been top-notch, and that's why he was rated to be a top-four pick in the that draft year in 2015. It's just that his defensive game has always been a little suspect. So we'll see. It's something to keep an eye on. So as we record this, we're 11 days away from the home opener. There's still lots of storylines to play out. There's still some roster spots to figure out, and it's going to be an exciting week. The Flames have the Vancouver Canucks and the Winnipeg Jets in a preseason match, one at home, one on the road. And then we start at home against the Oilers. So, Matt, let's enjoy this week of Flames hockey, and uh, we'll see how this roster shakes out. Oh, I'm just hoping that they get off to a good start and win that game in Anaheim, and then we can look forward to a fantastic season and hopefully a division championship before we worry about the game in Anaheim let's worry about beating Edmonton and Edmonton to start the season the series yeah I mean that was a disaster last year well as long as they keep it to under seven goals it's all good <laughs> and we'll, we'll talk more about this you know in coming shows but I think we've got a pretty easy look in October yeah, same here Ottawa Carolina you know LA Vancouver I think this is the month this team can really get off to a good start. Yeah, it's not like last year where it was murderer's row right through the middle of November. And, I mean, traditionally this team has a, a lousy start, let's be honest. So I think this, hopefully, if we can change things, like you said, if we can win in Anaheim, if we can start to take some of those steps, that's going to be a good thing. Yep. Thanks for listening, everybody, and hopefully we have another great season, both a Fireside Chat and on the ice for the Calgary Flames and just want to say thank you for listening and Dan and I both appreciate your viewership and we look forward to making changes and all of that so that way you guys enjoy what we're doing and just go Flames go go Flames go Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. 
Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.